Hi, everyone. I am here by my lonesome here today. It feels kind of quiet when I'm just here by myself and not talking to someone ahead of time. So please talk to me and let me know you're here. Today, we have a very, very important topic. Every day is an important topic as we lead up to our big webinar day on Thursday. So if you are live and you are watching us from either YouTube or Facebook, I tried to get on Instagram today and I couldn't. Um, I I'm logged out and I'm not sure how to get logged back in. I can't get my password to work. So anyway, if you're here, thank you, Karen, for letting us know from YouTube. Who else is here from Facebook or from YouTube? We would love to hear. Thank you, Lori Ann. Good to see your uh, smiling face on the screen again. Welcome. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here and you're listening. This is a really, really important topic. Hi, Carol Sue from Virginia. Good to see you here, too. Yeah, others are here, other familiar faces. I see you. Happy Tuesday. Thank you. Happy Tuesday to you, too. Oh, it's been a whirlwind, whirlwind stuff. Jennifer, thank you. Thank you. This is our public Facebook page. We've just gotten a reminder about that. Uh, so just be careful what you say, especially on our today's topic, because staying well or leaving well, you don't want to announce your divorce on Facebook or that you're leaving or separating or something like that. Do not announce that here. So if you need to ask a private question that you don't want to actually put on the Facebook feed itself, Karen is my assistant here. Uh, she will be putting some links on there. If you want to ask a private question, what you would do is you would go to lesliebernick.com. Let me see if I can find it now. Of course, the, there's a Google Doc on top of it, which I don't know how to get rid of. <laughs> there it goes. Um, Let's see, I don't see it on the Google Docs, Karen, of how to ask a private question. So if you could please put it in the feed. Um, there it is. If you have an anonymous question, follow the link. Um, there's a lesliebernick.com forward slash question link. And you can just ask that, go there, type your question, and then Karen will take that question and put it over here for me so that you don't have to put it on the Facebook um, link itself or the YouTube screen itself so that you can be a little bit more private with your question. I hope by now you have signed up for your workshop. I can't imagine that you would come to all these Facebook lives. Many of you I've seen you day after day after day after day, and you wouldn't have signed up for our workshop yet. I'm sure you have, but in case you haven't, or you do have a friend who is thinking about doing it, you might want to encourage her to sign up. We're getting um, a lot of women interested, and we want to make sure that anyone who wants to be there live gets all the information ahead of time. We're going to be sending you a workbook ahead of time and things for you to go over. So, um, and just how to show up and all those kind of things. So please um, sign up now so that you can get all that information ahead of time instead of last minute. All right. Today we're talking about, is it possible? Is it possible to stay well? So I think we have two questions to answer today. One is, is it possible to stay well in a destructive marriage? And if it is possible, how do you do it? Um, so those are the questions we're going to ask. Let's start with, first of all, maybe even what does it mean to stay well? Like maybe it's not possible. So what the link is broken, Priscilla says, for the sign up for the workshop. Uh, so Karen, could you just check that to make sure it's working? Um, because if it isn't working, you'll need to contact Kim to get that working right away so that we get that fixed for the last two days of our workshop. Um, Anyway, so what does it mean to stay well? Let's start there and then whether you can or can't, and that might be an individual situation depending on the severity of the destruction going on in your marriage and the destruction that's going on in your own body, right? So what does it mean to stay well? What does it mean? Give me a definition for you. What does it mean to stay well? I have my definition, but I want to know because I think what we think it means depends on whether we can do it or not, right? So what does it mean to stay well? What does it mean to stay well? Put it in the chat. What's your idea of staying well? If you were going to choose that, what would, what would that look like for you? And if it's not possible for you, why not? What would be some of the determining factors that it's not possible to even do that? Any thoughts? So Karen says the link did work. So try again. It's lesliebernick.com forward slash join workshop, all one word. Don't put spaces in there. Mental well-being. All right. So, so if your mental well-being, so what would you need to do? Yesterday we had this conversation. Many of you were here, not letting his moods or actions dictate mine. Yeah. So there has to be some sort of ability for you to regulate your 
biology. And when we live pe with people, understand their energy and their moods do affect us. That's just how it works. Um, you know, our, our call them vibes, whatever they are, our, our body does emit energy of our mood, good and bad. And it does impact other people around us unless you know how to protect yourself from that negative energy, especially. Reflect on my thoughts when hit with verbal abuse content and remind myself that I am not what he says I am. So you certainly have to be able to know how to do that. To stay well for me is to choose your battles and don't respond to everything. Yeah. Yeah. So that you pick what's most important to you and you let a lot go because you know you're not going to you're not going to have the energy or it's not worth it to fight for stuff that is insignificant. Janice says to live my life, allow him to live his life and not expect anything in return from him. I can take care of myself. Okay. What does that sound like for you? It doesn't sound like a great marriage, but it might be how you can stay in a icky, destructive marriage well. Right? Peace and fulfilled. Yeah. Maybe I can be peaceful and fulfilled even if I don't have a good marriage. Is that possible? Is that possible to be peaceful and fulfilled even if the marriage is a D minus marriage? Yeah. Yeah, Priscilla, if you're having trouble, just email and we'll get you signed up, okay? Please don't let that, whatever tech issue you're having at your end, we'll get you signed up. Just email like, um, as Karen has said. Teresa says, my thoughts waver. I don't think you can stay well, the more I know. I think it would be ignoring the truth. Okay. No verbal communication. Deepening my identity in Christ. Okay. You've all got some really good, good ideas. So, so sometimes it's not possible to stay well. And sometimes it is possible to stay well, depending on what you define as staying well and why. And why are you staying? Why wouldn't you leave? Because I want you to understand, we've done this <coughs> challenge. I'm not this challenge, but this whiteboard before. Okay. We've got our internal stuff and we've got our external stuff. So let's say externally as you stay, so you're in this marriage, I'm left-handed, so I got to use this side. If you stay, okay, and internally, you're feeling scared and angry and hopeless, well, that wouldn't be staying well, right? Now, maybe externally, not only are you staying, but it's also dangerous. You know, you're being physically assaulted, you're being physically threatened, you're being um, sexually abused, you're being emotionally battered, right? So, so if out here is really hostile outwardly and aggressively hostile, it may not be possible for you to stay well. So one of the big criteria is how safe can you be out here and in here? So if you just don't bother him, you don't ask him for anything, you pick your battles, all those kind of things, maybe you can stay in the same household and have some measure of peace and safety and your own life, okay? So we have to look at both things, but understand that if we choose to leave, so we're not staying, we're leaving, can't spell and talk at the same time. Leaving, if we choose to do that, there's still challenges here. Like I may not have a place, to, I might have no money. That would be external. Okay, I might feel scared and angry and hopeless too, right? Because I have no money. I feel lonely. I don't have friends. I never made a life other than my marriage. Okay, so every decision that we make has its challenges, right? There's no pass like, oh, this is the easy way. This is the hard way. I think I'll pick the easy way. <laughs> There's no pass from hard. Life is hard sometimes, all right? So it doesn't make staying the easy choice and leaving the hard choice or leaving the easy choice and staying the vice versa. It doesn't mean that. It means what's best for you right now. And is it possible to stay well? That's our question for today. If you leave, that presents its own challenges. Okay. So let's start with this. <clears throat> you can't stay well in a dangerous situation. No, you can't. No, you can't. Okay. 
So um, I think you would have to have a good support system, but I don't know if that would have helped in my case because he had the support because he was so dishonest. Yeah. Staying in separate locations. Sometimes you might just be waiting well. Okay. And that, and that may be true because staying is for now, right? Staying well is for when you can until you can't for whatever reason, either he's escalating or you're not coping well, right? So if you choose to stay well, please don't feel like that's a decision that has to stay forever. It might be, I'm staying well my, while my kids are little because I don't trust that he would be a good father, um, not because he's dangerous to his kids. He's just kind of oblivious and he doesn't pay attention to the children when they're, you know, he's watching TV and he's watching a football game and they could be climbing out the window and he'd never notice, right? So it might be when my kids are little, I don't trust that he could be an adequate, safe caregiver of a two-year-old or a six-month-old. So I'm going to stay well for now. All right. Lori says, I can't stay well with a delusional husband. He has betrayed me way too much. It feels like fight or flight every day. Communication is minimal. And when it happens, it's so difficult. I have to move forward for my peace of mind. So he has to sell the house since he can't buy me out. Okay. And that's a legal issue about what he has to do legally uh, to finalize a divorce. But sometimes we cannot stay well. So please don't hear me say, you know, all of you should stay well. That's God's will. I am not saying that at all. But I also think that for some Christian women, they're not ready, they're not prepared, or they're not spiritually free yet to leave. All right. They're still feeling like, you know, a little guilt or they're not sure. And so we have to help them learn to stay well, because if they don't, they're going to continue to get sicker and sicker in a toxic environment. And then we have women in our organization who can't leave, who can't leave because they have no resources. Their body has broken down. They need the medical insurance so much that they're hostage in some ways, they have no means of support. Their children are alienated. It's gotten so bad and they waited too long. They waited too long. And so here's where my message to you, especially in the workshop will be about you getting stronger. Whether you stay, whether you leave, you have to learn some important lessons during this season of your life. Hard lessons, no fun, but the, the lessons that you learn will serve you the rest of your life. And the first lesson you need to learn is that even if your husband doesn't love you, you are loved. You are loved. You are loved by your almighty God, your heavenly father. Nothing can separate you from his love. Not a divorce, not a mistake, not even a rebellious streak. We think of the story of the prodigal son. He went off and spent all of his father's money and he came back, came to his senses, and it didn't separate him from the father's love. So if your husband doesn't love you, and if you're in a destructive marriage, he doesn't. God sees, God knows, God loves you. You are loved. But the person whose love you need, as not as much as God's love, but in addition to God's love, is you need to love yourself. And I'm not talking about a narcissistic, self-indulgent, self-pampering love. I'm talking about a, I value myself as God's daughter. God values me as his daughter and I value myself. So I'm not going to allow myself to be abused any longer. I'm not going to allow myself to be treated like an infant or a slave if I can help it, right? Now, if I'm captured by a person who's holding a gun to my head, I'm going to comply, in order until I can, can get away. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to comply until I can get away. I would say in most of the situations that we're talking about with all of you, that's not your situation. You're scared in, in a different way. But you have to value yourself. And it's not about sticking up for yourself with your husband and saying, you can't treat me that way. I'm God's daughter. I mean, you might try it. And that might shock him into some awareness. But in essence, you have to say that to yourself. I'm not letting myself be treated this way. Yesterday, we talked about who's responsible for who. Who's responsible for who? And everybody who was present yesterday said, I'm responsible for myself. You're responsible for your safety. You're responsible for your happiness. You're responsible for your financial stability. All right. And if your husband's mismanaging money or 
using the money inappropriately or you don't know how to have any of your own money, that's something you need to learn. That's what adults have to learn is how to be responsible financially for themselves. When we get married, we share that responsibility. Sometimes it works out really well and sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, who's responsible for that? For me, 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 you. And I think, again, as women, we have been, especially in Christian circles, we have been um, actually groomed to stay children. We're allowed to go to college because we might find our husband there, but we're really not supposed to work. We're really not supposed to be career-minded. We're really supposed to be house and children-minded. And if we're wanting to do both, there's something wrong with us. And that's changing a little bit. But even women I talk to, young women, you know, they'll say, I just want to be a mom. I just want to be a wife. I just want to stay home with my kids. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all, as long as you're capable of getting out to work if you have to. If you have to. So what I'm saying right now is if you're in this situation, this might be a temporary situation or a permanent where you choose to stay well. But what is it that you have to do to do that, to stay well and not just stay resentfully? Because you can leave resentfully too. You can leave a marriage. There's plenty of women and men who have left a marriage who are bitter and angry and resentful and um, still aren't taking responsibility for themselves. They're blaming everybody else for how their life is so awful and what happened to me. And they're not doing their work. They're not doing their work. So every situation gives you an opportunity to learn to do your work. Yeah, I'm just reading some of the chat. She's, she's take, making a plan. The Bible tells us to be shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves, especially when dealing with wicked people. We're not to retaliate. We're not to repay evil with evil. But that doesn't mean we're not making a plan to get out of there. Right? That doesn't mean that. The prudent see danger and take refuge. But I want to get back to our topic. What does it look like to stay well? So I thought of a couple of different examples that might be helpful for us to illustrate. Let's say that you were paralyzed by a drunk driver and you had to stay in a wheelchair. It wasn't your fault, but here you are, stuck in a wheelchair. What would you need to do to stay well in that wheelchair? What would you need to do? You wish you weren't in it. It's not your fault you're in it, but here you are, you're in it. What would you need to do to stay well in a wheelchair? Any answers? Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Acceptance. Acceptance, right? Because a lot of times we resist reality and this is true for women in destructive marriages. They keep hoping I'm alive, like, oh, it's not that bad. Or I can really change him. If only I pray hard enough, God will change him, right? So acceptance, like, oh, the rest of my life, I'm going to be stuck in this wheelchair. I don't like that. And so we get so angry about reality that we resist reality and we don't accept it. And I'm not saying accept it means we're happy about it. If I have breast cancer, I'm not going to be happy about it, but I am going to accept it. Because the only way I can deal with something in a healthy way is to accept what is, even if I don't like it. Mindset. Yeah, stay connected to friends. So if I'm in a wheelchair, I have to first accept that I'm in a wheelchair. And I'm going to grieve all the things I don't have anymore, things that I can't do anymore. Like I can't, although, guess what? I played, I didn't play, but I watched someone play pickleball in a wheelchair. And they were playing actually as well as the able-bodied people. She was a tennis wheelchair player and she's playing pickleball and she's whooping around that pickleball court <laughs> and she can play pickleball from her wheelchair. She was paralyzed. She was an Olympian. She got paralyzed in a bike accident. She was a biker and uh, somebody crashed into her and she lost her legs and she's in a wheelchair the rest of her life and she does Olympic sports in her wheelchair and she's made the most of that. She's accepted, I'm a paraplegic, and I am going to live my life, not with bitterness and resentment that I'm a paraplegic. I'm going to learn what I can do as a paraplegic. And guess what? I can play pickleball. I can play tennis. I can still be an Olympian in the Special Olympics. She didn't let that ruin her life, right? So it's mindset. It's mindset. How do I live within what, where I am? 
Paul says it in Philippians where he says, I have learned to be content, even in jail. I'm staying well in jail. If I get a chance to get out, I'm getting out. But right here, right now, if, if Johnny Erickson Tata had a chance to be healed, I'm sure she would say, I'm first in line. But she's lived her whole life from a wheelchair. And she's lived it well. She's lived it well. So ladies, it may not be the marriage that you want. It may be a dangerous marriage and you need to leave. It may be a very um, toxic marriage and it's affecting you physically and you need to steward you. And that means you have to care about you. You need to get therapy or you need to get trauma care. You need to move out. But some of you aren't ready to do that yet. So you need to prepare. Maybe you need to get your college degree or you need to recertify yourself as a teacher or a nurse because you let that go because you didn't think you'd need it and now you need it. And you have to be in this environment for a bit. How do you stay well? Your mindset is the starting point. I have to accept where I am and stop trying to fix my marriage into what I want it to be. I have to stop putting all my energy in trying to change him. And how do I accept just like if a paraplegic put all her energy into trying to walk again, that door has shut. That's not going to happen. But how does she learn to ma maneuver that wheelchair as a pro? She can learn to do that. She can learn to do that. She can learn to play tennis and race. Instead of running, she can race in her wheelchairs and she can do a lot of good things. She just has to do them differently. So how do you come to accept that your marriage is not going to be what you want? that you're not going to have the companion that you thought he was. You're not going to have someone who's got your back and cares about you. But the person who has your back is you and God. Is that true for you? Is that true for you? Yeah, except our values don't match. Yeah, I want a local support system of friends. People seem too self-absorbed to make new friends. Yeah, sometimes they are. Sometimes they are. But that doesn't mean they're not out there. And we will open our doors to conquer on Thursday for those of you who want to join our online support group. And I'll tell you, every time I go to a city in this country or in wherever I go, um, I may be going to Korea next year. If there's any Korean sisters who would love to meet, I would love to meet you in Seoul. But um, Wherever I go, I've been to England, I've met Conquer Sisters. I've been to Vancouver recently, met Conquer Sisters. I go to North Carolina, Nashville, I meet Conquer Sisters. And my goal is to go there and meet them so that they can meet each other, so that you do have a local support system, because it is priceless. And when you know women who know what your life is like and you don't have to explain, because they're in the same situation, it is double priceless. And so that's so important. You're right, Amanda. Don't give up. You do need that. And keep looking for it. But meanwhile, you might want to think about joining our online support group. Um, so trust that God has a plan. Learn to live in a new normal. Like I'm not going to focus on my marriage, but I am going to focus on my ability to support myself. So that if there is a place in time where I can't stay well anymore, I don't feel so paralyzed and scared that I don't know how to get a job, that I don't have any skills. You can do lots of online courses, even if you're not ready to leave uh, you know, the house yet because you have littles or things like that. You can take online courses. You can learn to be, I mean, every single one of my staff, I hired 12 people. They all work virtually. Most of them have never met one another. You can work virtually, part-time, full-time. There's lots that you can do if you just change your mindset to my story isn't turning out like I thought it would. But now... Who's the author of my story? It's God and me. And I have to make the next right choices. And if I choose to stay well for a season, how do I steward myself so I can do that? Well, one is I have to let go of him. I have to let go of trying to make him do anything, including understand. Right? We spend a ton of energy trying to get him to understand. I just need him to understand he doesn't want to understand. It doesn't serve him because then he would have to change if he really understood. So he has no interest in understanding. He has an interest in maintaining control. And we'll talk more in detail about that in the workshop. So how, depending on how much control he wants over you and how much freedom you have, you might not be able to stay well because you can't get out of the house. Or you might be able to stay well for a season 
Or maybe he's just plain indifferent. As long as you don't bug him, as long as you don't confront him, as long as you don't ask him for anything, as long as you don't correct him on anything, as long as you don't argue with him on anything, he's fine just doing his own thing and watching TV and you leave him alone and he's okay. And maybe you can stay well while you're growing, building your life, making new friends, investing in your children, investing in yourself, being kind to him, not expecting him to change and not turning into someone ugly because he won't. That's what staying well looks like. Whether or not that's what God's calling you to do for a season, that's not me to judge or to advise even. That's a decision you have to make. But these are your choices. These are your choices. Okay, so it's better to be conscious of your choices than to default. Because what we'll do is if we're not conscious of our choices, we're just going to default to our normal pattern. All right. And I've shared this story before, but I'll just give it to you again. I was walking the other day. My default pattern has always been to look at the negative. I'm a pessimist by nature, class FMT kind of girl. Um, sometimes it serves me very well. So I can see what's wrong really easily in counseling. I'm a great diagnostician. I, I was a great, great therapist. I can pick out what's wrong. I can, you know, whether they want to change it or not is a whole other story. But I'm really good at seeing everything that's wrong in this world. There's a plus side to that. And there is a huge negative side to that. Right. So but I'm good at it. I'm good at that part. I'm not so good at remembering the good, focusing on the good seeing the good first off. I usually always see the bad first off, okay? And I'm just being real with you. That's just my nature. I used to have a disease. It's called worst case scenario disease. My kid labeled it that way because I would always worry about the worst thing that might happen. If they were going to go drive at night, you know, they're going to get carjacked or they're going to get stuck in a snowstorm and some weirdo is going to stop and try to help, you know, just all the bad thoughts that have. And I, for 40 of my years, my first 40 years, I was crippled by anxiety, fear, and negative thoughts. So that's my default mode, so I'm telling you that. But I've worked hard to change that. So I'm on this walk, and I have my headphones on, and I'm listening to a great audiobook, and it stops. And my default mode would be to be like grumbling, complaining, it's like, what's wrong with this phone? And blah, 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 and kind of get myself all agitated. So I started, like, I could feel the tension right away. Started trying to fix my phone, it didn't work. You know how, how technical I am, I'm not very. So if it doesn't turn on the, the, the button, I'm not exactly sure what else I'll do. So turn it off, turn it on, all that didn't work. And then I stopped and I said, I have a choice. I have a choice. I can either finish my walk, grumbling and complaining that my phone doesn't work and I can't finish listening to my audiobook, which would have been what I used to do, just totally automatic. I would have never even thought about it. I would have just thought, that's, that's how my walk went. And I stopped and I said, I have a choice. I can enjoy my walk. I can look around me. I can listen to the birds. I can see the little animals scurrying. I can see the little tarantula on the ground. I can notice things that I'm not noticing when I'm listening to my book. And I chose the better path. So these are your choices, but you don't have them if you're not conscious of them. So I can stay well. I can stay bitter. That's your choice. But sometimes we just default. We don't realize we have a different choice. I can leave well. Forgiving, not holding a grudge, doing my own work to get strong. Or I can leave bitter. How many of you have known a divorced woman who's left, left, but she's never really left? She's still angry and resentful. He remarried. He got all the stuff. He's happy. I'm still miserable. He did this to me. And they're just miserable people. They don't have to be, but they don't recognize they have a choice. And if there's anything that I want you to get out of this workshop, is one of your inalienable rights, not only as an American citizen, but as a child of God, is your choice. Got it. God gave Adam and Eve a chooser to choose him, to not to choose him, to choose to love, to choose to hate, to choose to live in faith, to choose to live in fear. 
but we don't even realize that we have those choices unless you're listening to someone like me or you stop and pause and you say, wait a minute, I'm heading to negative land. <laughs> I know what that looks like. I've been there, done that all my life. I don't have to do that anymore. What else can I do? How can I learn to let this aggravation go? How can I learn to let go of the boogeyman in my head all the time? I have a gigantic boogeyman in my head that always warns me of all the dangers that could possibly happen. I ruined my whole first pregnancy worrying about what might happen. It never happened. My son is 45. He's never even broken a bone or been in the hospital in his life. And yet I had all kinds of fears of what might happen. And I didn't enjoy the pregnancy or the birth at all because of all of the fears I had. So I'm just saying, ladies, God has done work in me. Um, and it doesn't mean that I'm not pent up with it. But I recognize what's happening and I choose not to go there. Not to go there. Worry doesn't serve me. Jesus says, why worry about a single day in your life? You can't control what's going to happen tomorrow. Right? And so if you stay, choose to stay well. And what does that look like for you? And what do you need to learn? Like I had to learn to press pause, like in the middle of that walk, press pause. You feel it. I feel that icky agitation stirring up in my soul. I feel it. Now what? I have a choice. Is this going to ruin my day, rule my day, rule my mind? You can't control him. I couldn't control my phone. Can't control the circumstances sometimes. If you can control them, if you can so let's do this external, internal again, and then we're going to go to some questions. Here's the internal. Here's the external. Okay. So if my bed is messy, so I have a messy bed, and it's all messy, or my sink is full of dishes, internally I feel icky. Okay. And if I can clean this up, and feel fine, I'm going to do that. Right? So I'm not saying just leave all this go. If I can control something here so that I feel better, if I could have gotten my audio book back on, I would have been fine. It's just that when you can't control this, how do you learn to be okay here? How do you learn when this is out of control, whether in big ways or little ways? How do you learn... Paul said, I have learned to be content when this isn't the way I want it to be. I've learned that I don't have to have my peace robbed because out here isn't working out the way I thought it should. Or I'm not being treated fairly. Or I'm not getting the love that I thought I was going to get when I signed the marriage certificate. How do I learn to trust God in these moments? These are all opportunities for you to grow, to learn, to become more and more the person that God called you to be, his workmanship, that doesn't need to live afraid or ashamed. So thoughts, questions? Did we talk about how enough? How do I stay well? It's not about fixing him. It's not about fixing your marriage. It's about working on your own mindset and your own emotional regulation so that you're not triggered by his moods, that you're not triggered by his, and when you are triggered, you don't blame him. You say, whoops, he triggered me. Just like my thoughts trouble me, I am distraught. Oh, I'm aware. What do I need to do to calm myself down? What do I need to do to take care of me? Because I'm responsible for me. He's not responsible for me. He doesn't even care about me. So he triggered me, called me a name or, you know, said something or did something. I found out he was cheating again. He triggered me again. And what am I going to do to take care of me? If you don't love yourself and you don't care about yourself and you're constantly asking someone else to take care of you by fixing them, you're always going to be in a very dependent, unhealthy position. And I don't want that for you. I would love for you to have a happy marriage, but I want you to be a healthy woman more. More. Thoughts? Questions? Put them in the chat or put them in that private thing. Let me see here. Yeah, sometimes I feel a bit ugly because his habits of biking, computer, reading, he refuses to change them, yeah? You can't change him. You can't change him. I, I would give you a challenge. 
I would like you to think of something small that you can't change. Maybe it's about your weight. Maybe it's about your age. <laughs> you know, I'm struggling with that at this point. Maybe it's about something in your health that's not going to change anytime soon. What would it be like if you just accepted it? What would it be like if you just said, you know what? I'm going to accept this and not just let everything deteriorate, but I'm going to make the best of what I'm, what I have. So if my weight is 20 pounds heavier than I want to be, instead of beating myself up every day over it and creating a lot of stress and anxiety for myself, what if I just dressed my best self, even 20 pounds overweight or whatever it is about you that you don't like? What if you just accepted it? without self-hatred, without shame, without beating yourself up. Yes, I am getting older and it's going to look, it's going to show and I'm not going to look like I was and, you know, just accept it, but I'm going to look my best. However that is, right? Whatever age that is, I'm going to just do my best, but it's not going to turn me, turn the clock back anymore. Right. Could we do that? What would, what would be different about you if you could do that? My husband is my husband. He's, or maybe my ex-husband is my ex-husband. And he's not going to change. It's not my responsibility to change him. So why am I letting him aggravate me so much? What am I still expecting from him that he's not giving me that keeps hurting me? What if I just let that go? What if I just accepted that he's unwilling or incapable of being the man I thought he was? He's unwilling or incapable of being the man I thought he was. And maybe there's still pieces of him that are good. Maybe he's a good provider. Maybe he's a good handyman around the house. Maybe he's other good, good things in his life that, that you can respect. But he's incapable of being emotionally connected. He's unwilling to grow himself in that way. Can you let that go? And that doesn't mean you have a great marriage. It means that you're not in turmoil all the time because you're not accepting it. It's like sitting in the wheelchair, being angry that you're in the wheelchair every single day. Imagine what that does to your body because you haven't accepted that you're in the wheelchair. Okay, so I'm going to go to some questions. What about Titus 2, 3 through 5? Following God's word. Let me read it. <laughs> Let's just get it get it clear from God's word because we want to make sure we honor God's word. And I think God's word has been used as a club to women to keep them controlled. So Titus is about women. I know that's about. All right. So for you, Titus, three through five. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely, to be pure, work in their homes, to do good, be submissive to their husbands, and then they will not bring shame to God. So what's your, what's your point, Colleen? What's your, so I would love to hear what you think about Titus 2, 3 through 5. Because I don't think this is, so here's where I think it might be tempting to take this passage and make it a mandate for everything about everything. And this is the danger uh, of misusing God's word. So we have to take the context and we have to take the, the whole scripture of, of God. So, so when God says, for example, thou shalt not lie, Colleen, he says that in the Old Testament, he says that in the New Testament, he says he hates it when people lie. That's a very, I hate in the Proverbs 6, he says, I hate when people lie. Okay. And so then we've got Rahab who lied to protect the Jewish spies when the soldiers from her town were coming to kill them. So would you point out to Rahab in that moment of decision? Well, God says, don't lie. See, this is where it gets really dicey because I think we can misuse the scripture to make someone feel guilty. Like, Oh, I should just trust God and say they went that way because I don't want to lie. Right. And so God's heart is for safety. And Rahab was never rebuked for lying. In fact, she's in the Hebrews Hall of Fame, right? She's in the Hebrews Hall of Fame of a woman of faith. And so I think it's really important. I don't disagree with this passage at all. 
But I think we have to take it in the context of the whole counsel of God's word. And yes, I think older women need to instruct other women. I think we need to be good mentors for one another. We need to be honest. And, not but, but and, there are times when a woman is in a terrible marriage and to instruct her that that's what God wants her to stay in a terrible marriage and just suck it up and allow herself and her children to be abused and mistreated, I think is misusing God's word. I think there's plenty of other places in God's word where it doesn't say that. And the word that I just want to capture in this passage in Titus, teach older women to live in a way that honors God. I agree. But does that always mean um, doing what the man wants? Not necessarily. All right. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. I think that's great advice for everyone. Instead, they should teach others what is good. This is the key. And we're going to be talking about this in the webinar. What is good in God's eyes? What is good? It is good to expose the unfruitful deeds of darkness, Ephesians says. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Rather, expose them. It is good to speak the truth in love. Don't cover up evil. Don't encourage women to cover up the evil of their husbands to protect their husbands. That's only enabling evil to flourish. So we have to look at this word good and say, okay, what else does God say is good? And is a wife not allowed to do that? Is she not allowed to call the police on her husband when he's breaking the law and hitting her or sexually abusing her or her children because that's dishonoring him? See, I, these are actual people that I've known that have gotten disciplined in their church for calling the police when their husband was doing illegal things and they're the one that are disciplined because they shouldn't have exposed him. They shouldn't have brought in the secular authorities, misusing the word of God. God has given us the secular authorities in Romans 13 to protect us against evildoers. And so I think we have to be really careful how we instruct people from the word of God and give people the freedom to pray and read God's word for themselves and ask God, what's their situation like? What's their instance like? Because it's not the same for everybody. What might be right for one woman in a situation might be absolutely toxic for another woman in a situation. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and I would love to, um, I think also to love their husbands and their children to live wisely what did the Proverbs 31 woman do? She lived very wisely. She's a woman of strength and dignity. And she made her own choices. She made her own money. She didn't just work at home. She worked in the, uh, in the garment industry. She sewed clothes. She sold things. She bought and sold fields. She was a realtor. She was a resourceful woman who didn't just work at home. And she's set up as the ideal virtuous woman. So again, we don't want to just look at this verse and say, well, this means women shouldn't work, and this means women shouldn't divorce, and this means women. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that at all, especially as we look at different women in the Bible and the contexts. So I think it gives a lot of good wisdom and instruction, but it doesn't necessarily describe what typical conservative Christians have told women it means, especially this word about what is doing, what is right, doing what is good. It is not good to tell a woman to submit to her husband only to enable him to continue to do more evil. That's actually against God, right? If he's doing more evil to her and the children by harming them and abusing them and she's to submit to that, I don't, no, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And I hope you don't either. I hope you've just been maybe confused a little bit by some of these different verses. And I think they can be very confusing and they can be very misused. Everything can be misused. Satan misused God's word to try to trick Jesus. Remember in the garden? Well, God says, if you jump off this cliff, the angels will support you. <laughs> and Jesus said, knock it off, Satan. You know, he knew exactly what he was doing. And so we have to be Again, good stewards of ourselves and good stewards of God's word that we're not so easily um, intimidated into doing what someone else tells us to do. 
This is our journey with us and the Lord, and we have to figure it out too. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, lives inside of us, and he tells us what is right. So it's important, ladies, that you listen and think. Listen and think for yourself. Discern for yourself. All right, questions. I got the Titus question done. Um, so I hope that answered it for you, Colleen. It's hard to be kind. I have stopped cooking for him. I feel guilty. He is verbally and financially abusive. How do you handle this? Um, without more details, I don't know that I can tell you how I would handle this, um, but let me just give you some general advice and then you plug in what you think might be helpful if that would be a good idea. Um, kindness is one of the fruit of the spirit, right? So, so God wants, if you're full of God, if you're going to be Christ-like, kind, Jesus was kind, God is kind to those who are sinners and saints alike, right? And so I kind of think of it this way. I want to be a kind person. That's who I am. I want to be a loving person like God. That's who God is. I don't want to change who I am just because someone else is a jerk. Like if they're a jerk, why would I let them change me into a jerk? Right? So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. And so it is harder to be kind. That's, I think, why Jesus says, love your enemy. Not because you're going to sleep with them or because you're going to kiss them or you're going to give them access to your bank account. That's not what love your enemy means. It means don't let, if they're an enemy, they've harmed you. They've, because if they weren't an enemy, they wouldn't, they'd just be a stranger. Okay. So they're a specific person to you. They're an enemy. They've harmed you and you don't feel safe with them. That's the idea of an enemy relationship, right? So when God says to love your enemy, he's not saying have a relationship with your enemy, invite them over for dinner. He's not saying that. What he's saying is don't let what they did to you change you. Don't let what they did to you affect who you are. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. And if so, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You don't have to make a law against those kind of people, right? So, so it is harder to be kind to someone who's not kind back. But that's your, that's your journey of saying, how do I want to show up? Regardless of whether they show up that way. How do I want to be? What's going to make me proud of myself? And I'm not saying be enabling kind. I mean just be kind. Even when you speak the truth in love, you can speak kindly. Like if I said to someone, I'm not able to listen to you anymore. The way that you're talking to me is so disrespectful. I just can't listen. I can say that kindly or I can say that you're being a jerk. Shut up. I could say it that way too. Right? Now, he might receive both of those ways just as ugly as, as possible. But when I put my head at the pillow that night, I'm going to be prouder of myself if I said it the first way than the second way. So who you are in the midst of adversity reveals your heart. The Bible tells out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we can't blame them when bad words start coming out of our mouth. That's showing us a little bit of our icky stuff too. Which is why Jesus says, take the lock out of your own eye before you start taking those specks out of someone else's. Because we got a lot of icky stuff in ourselves. So the fact that it's hard, I agree. But don't let that decide who you're going to be. If you're going to be like Christ, if you're going to be full of the Spirit, then the fruit of the Spirit is evident. And that's where you want to show up, at least people who listen to me, because that's where I want to show up. Okay? So you decide about that. But I think that's part of it. The second one is... Um, I have stopped cooking for him and I feel guilty. Okay, so I think you have to ask yourself, is cooking for him a way I can be kind? Is cooking for him with no strings attached? I'm not expecting him to change at all. But I can be kind to just like God sends rain to the evil and the good. Can I give food? If I'm cooking for me, I can cook for him. You know, is that something? If I don't cook for me, maybe then I won't cook for him. But if I cook for me, I can make a little extra for him and I can be kind. And not expect anything return because your heavenly father sees that. And then you can feel good about how you're showing up in a difficult situation. I can still be kind, right? I may not be able to kiss him. God's not asking you to kiss your enemy. 
right? He's your enemy. You don't trust him. You don't feel safe with him. But how can I be kind if that's who I want to be? So I would just say, let your guilty speak to you. Is that the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you're letting this man deform you. You're letting him turn you into someone who isn't looking like my daughter. I want you to look like my daughter and not be shaped by how he treats you. Last, he's verbally and financially abusive. How do you handle that? So the first step I would do is go to an attorney and make sure that you understand what your legal rights are financially. And what that, because I'm not, uh, you know, I don't know your state laws. I don't know. I do know marital laws. And as long as you're married to someone, you don't have a lot of say. If someone's not going to be a partner with you and they want to be the controller over all the money. Um, so if you have a means to work and have your own money, you might need to do some of that to get your own safety that way, your own safety net. Um, verbally, I would just say this. I hear you're angry. And I can't listen to you when you call me names. So you're not going to say, stop talking to me that way. You can't talk to me that way. You're verbally abusive. You're not going to use the you word at all because it's just going to inflame him. But what you are going to use is the I word. I won't listen when you talk to me that way. And you have a choice there. You turn around and walk away. You don't have to do it meanly. You just say, I won't listen. The financial piece of it, I think that's a... a a more um, long-term dangerous piece. Um, and I think, again, this is where naive Christian leaders have told women, well, just separate. You can't divorce. Well, okay. So I've actually confronted a church leader about that advice. So I said, okay, so you've advised my client that she can't get divorced. She can separate. Her husband's been financially mismanaging their money. He's been financially abusive. He's been physically abusive. He's been spiritually abusive. She can't divorce, but she can separate, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So if he takes all of their money and spends it on prostitutes and continues to you know, drain out their retirement and all that, you're going to pay her medical insurance and you're going to pay for her retirement money that was in there for her to live in if she doesn't have any money from the marital assets. Is that right? Well, no, why would I do that? Well, because you're telling her she's not able to legally protect herself. She's not able to legally go to court and get a divorce, which would protect her financial assets from her husband squandering them so that she's not in a destitute place. But you're not also going to compensate for that advice by giving her money to live on. You see, they, they tell you these ideal things. In an ideal world, you could do that. You could just separate the bank accounts and do that. But in our legal structure, it's not that way. And so again, the Bible is written in a culture for a certain culture as well. And divorce was permitted for certain instances. And I'm not prepared. I'll talk a little about that tomorrow at the, I mean, at the workshop. But what I'm saying to you is you've got to decide. And I think the only way that you can make good decisions about the financial abuse is to talk to an attorney and get some advice legally about what you're legally entitled to as a spouse and what you can protect legally. And that's my advice to you. Okay. Um, I had been doing that, but he throws away the food. It just doesn't eat it. So then what do you do then? Then just take it as he doesn't want me to cook for him. So that's not a, that's not a means of kindness. Right. So that, then I wouldn't do it. Just say, okay, I, you know, I, I made extra. I see that you don't want it. So I'm going to assume from, from here on end that you will just take care of your own food. You know, and, and not, and that, that's not mean. It's accepting his no. No, I don't want you to do that. No, I'm not going to eat your food. No, I'm going to throw it away. Okay, accept his no. He doesn't want that. Can you share more about how to determine a baseline for staying well? I have a high tolerance for his bad behavior. I think I put up with too much because I'm not sure how to gauge that for my self-care and well-being. Well, that's a really good, yeah, I, I do too. I have a high tolerance for some bad behavior. Um, and not others. So I have a low tolerance for verbal abuse. I grew up with it. And even my children, I said, not listening to this. <laughs> you know, and they would start getting snarky with their, their tongues. So, um, but I, I can certainly understand that. And I think having a good tolerance for someone's foibles can be actually healthy in a relationship, as long as they're owning their foibles and working on them, if they feel justified to, you know, vomit all over you all of the time. Um, no, but I think this is where you have to ask yourself, why am I staying well? Why am I staying, right? Or why would I want to leave, right? So if I'm in an unhappy marriage, how do I learn to be a happy person? And when you have a high tolerance, I don't know what his behavior is toward you. 
um, for his bad behavior. So when you say I put up with too much, that that piece I'm not so. I, so what shouldn't you put up with? You shouldn't put up with sexual abuse. You shouldn't put up with physical abuse. Call the authorities. Those are things that are against the law, and they are damaged to you, damaging to you, even if you're used to it, right? So we can become a have a high tolerance for being hit or, or raped in a marriage because we thought we didn't have a choice, and so that you ha you have your no, even in in your marriage, you have your no. And if you are being overruled physically and harmed physically and harmed sexually, I would say that's a hard no. That's a hard no. Don't put up with that, right? If he's got a, a foul mouth um, and you can walk away, why don't argue, don't engage. There's no arguing with a fool like that. Don't argue, don't engage. We use the word jade. It's not my term, but jade, don't justify, don't argue, don't defend, don't explain. Just exit the situation. I'm not having a conversation like this. All right. So can you have a high tolerance for a big gold drag down fight? Yes, but it's not good for you, but it's not good for him either. So don't do it. Don't do it. Um, I don't know what other, I have a high tolerance for him having multiple affairs. Well, if he has multiple affairs and he's not asking you to be sexual with him, maybe it's okay for you to have a high to tolerance for that. Or if he's watching porn and he's not asking you to participate in those things, maybe you can we have a type of tolerance with that because you're taking care of your kids and you have a safe house and it's an environment that you can raise them in and he's a decent dad. So there's other perks that go along with that. So I don't know what the bad behavior is. And I think there are some bad behaviors that you should not tolerate because whether or not you feel they're bad, they might feel normal to you, especially if you were raised in a similar environment, but it's still not good for you. And it's not good to enable him. And I think this is the, this is the, uh, thing that I think is really important, Go, going back to Titus, this verse in Titus that Colleen opened up, if we were created to be his helpmate, how many of you read that book? <laughs> when I read that book, I almost like had a heart attack. Um, so in her version, Debbie Pearl's version of that book, it's like you were created to be his slave, do what he wants whenever he wants, because that's what God wants you to do. That's not the definition of helpmate. In fact, God himself describes himself as our helpmate and ever present help in times of trouble. So it's not God is my slave and he does whatever I want and he just submits to me. That's not the definition of wife and it's not the definition of helpmate. But the definition of helpmate, as is the definition of love, is that you seek the person's highest good, right? So that's why when you love your children, you don't let them play with their iPads all day long, even though they want to, because their highest good is to go to school and to get some sleep. You don't let them eat Dunkin' Donuts for dinner because their highest good is to eat some protein and hopefully some vegetables once in a while, right? So, so you, you aren't the parent to the husband as you are the parent to the child, but you love your child. And so you don't let them kick you when they're angry because that's not a healthy way to express your emotions. And even though they have anger and you can validate that they're angry, you don't permit kicking, right? Because you love them, not just because you're protecting your own body, but because you love your kid. In the same way, being a helpmate to a husband isn't enabling their dysfunction in silence. If your husband had a black mole on the back of his neck that he didn't see, as a helpmate, you would say, I'm really concerned about this black mole I see on the back of your neck. I think it might be melanoma. Please go get it checked out. You're his second set of eyes. Hebrews 3.13 says, um, let us encourage one another day after day, lest any one of us become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If we're to be our husband's helpmate, you are his truth teller. You are the mirror for him of him that he cannot see as he is for you. If you're functioning in a good helpmate relationship. And so for Christians to silence women, like you can only tell him he's wonderful. You can't tell him he's being a jerk and you wouldn't use those words. But I'm saying, if we're not allowed to be honest, your behavior is so unbecoming to the man that God calls you to be. The way you're talking to our children is so abusive that you aren't going to teach them what a heavenly father sounds like by talking to them that way. If a woman isn't allowed to speak the truth in love to her husband and be his helpmate, then what's she there for? Just sex and food? 
then she's just there as a robot. You can get a robot for that. Right? God has called you to be his partner and to have his back, not enabling him to sin, but helping him grow into a better, best version of him. Not the version you think he should be, the version God made him to be, as he's to do for you. I mean, that's the purpose of marriage and family life, really, is to help us all grow into maturity. But when a woman is silenced with a, a muzzle because she's to be, to be submissive and obedient, that's really not the definition of a helpmate. So again, we look at that verse in Genesis and we look at this verse in Titus, we can't put this verse in Titus into a place where, oh, she just has to stay at home and be the good wife and cook his meals and have sex. with. That's not what it's saying. To do him good means sometimes to take the log out of your own eye so you can speak to the speck in his eye. Or Galatians 6 1 says, You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So we need to use our words wisely, but we do need to have the freedom to use our words honestly. So those would be my recommendations to you. Long way of saying that. This isn't about living well. I actually decided to leave well six years ago, and now I'm living a rich, happy, blessed life with my kids. Of course, there are hard days, but no longer I'm being abused. My question is more because I'm dating someone who was wondering if it's biblical to marry a divorced woman. My ex didn't cheat on me. He was abusive, and I find comfort in knowing my heavenly father did not want me to live in a home with abuse and emotional abandonment. Is there something I can say to my boyfriend to give him reassurance? If not, I am prepared to walk away. I think that's your boyfriend's work to do, actually. So if he's the godly man that he says, or he seems to be like, oh, I have some convictions about this or I have some reservations about this, then I would say as his um, girlfriend, by all means, go do your work. Figure out what the Lord's saying to you. I don't think it's your job to be his Holy Spirit or your job to be his Bible or your job to figure that out for him. That's his responsibility before the Lord. Am I free to marry a, a divorced woman? Right? So your job is to decide, are you free to remarry? And that's your work to do. Your job isn't to do his work. Right? So if we kind of divide who's responsible for what, he's responsible. And this will show you a lot. Because if he's a truly a godly man, he will do his work and he will seek out wise counsel and he will read the word of God and he will read, you know, different ways people have viewed different verses and he'll pray and he'll decide. And that will get, be a good sign for you that he's truly a godly man. If he's just wanting to get out of the relationship and maybe he's using this as a reason, why do, your, why do his work for him? Because that's just going to be another bad situation, right? So I would just say to him, Wow, that really impresses me that you're wrestling with that. And why don't we take a break from each other and you really figure out what God's calling you to do? Because I only want you to do what God's calling you to do and leave it to him to do his own work. That's my best advice to you. What should I say to my husband who says he's not happy when one, he's only thinking about his happiness and wants and two, He's the one who caused division. Or two. What should I say to my husband who says he's not happy when one, he's only thinking about his happiness and wants, and two, he's the one who caused the division in our home? Well, I think if you could get over blaming him for that, um, I think you could say to him, so what do you think would make you happy? So instead of getting defensive or argumentative about why he's not happy, um, just ask him a curious question. Show interest in his in a conversation with him about his unhappiness. So why do you think you're unhappy? Well, I'm happy because you won't talk to me, or you won't have sex with me, or you know you don't want you don't love me anymore. You say, okay, and and do you want that to be different? What do you think needs to happen for our relationship to get better? So I think you could be very strategic and very loving by inviting him to talk about his unhappiness and be a curious, compassionate listener. It doesn't mean you're going to do what he wants because what he wants is he might want to say, I just want you to do what I want all the time. And then I would be happy, right? which may be exactly what he wants, but let him say it. Let him say out loud what he wants. Then you can decide whether or not that's possible for you. But at least now, you know, instead of just assuming and assuming. So he's taken the first step and told you he's not happy. And I would be extremely curious in my book, the emotionally destructive marriage. I actually ask 
you'd have a conversation with a man about that and say, are you happy? And if he says no, what do you think, what would you think would make you happy? And let him articulate it. And if it's, you know, I want a Barbie doll robotic, you know, wife who does what I want her to do when I want her to do it and doesn't give me any grief. That'll tell you something, right? That'll tell you something because it might be that you say, wow, that's what I thought. <laughs> no wonder we're having so many problems because I'm not her. I'm not her. I'm not a Barbie robotic person. I've, God's given me a good mind and I feel like God, he's called me to steward and use it. And when I argue with you or disagree, I'm trying to be your helper to make us a better family. I'm not a robot. So now where do you want to go from here? Um, and it might lead to a really an interesting conversation. Okay. See, these are opportunities, ladies, that you have to make a difference in your marriage and even in your man, if you can get over being so angry at him for being not the man that you want him to be. And he's angry with you too because you're not the woman he wants you to be. Because all of us go into marriage with kind of a fantasy idea of who our husband's going to be or who our wife is going to be. And then there's this wake-up call period of, oh, my gosh. Like even Beth Moore talked about it with her husband. She goes, you know, I will realize I'm not Barbie and he's not Ken and this is not our dream house. And now we've got to figure this out. And that's every marriage. And hopefully most couples do figure it out. But some don't because they're married to the version of who they thought you were and they're not willing to accommodate and accept a real person. <clears throat> how do we stay in the environment that broke us up if it's not practical to leave? Oh, how do we stay in the environment that broke us if it's not practical to leave? Well, you know, I think again, these are limiting beliefs that you have. So if you had a tornado come through your house and damage your house, if you had a black mold problem that was causing you severe asthma, pneumonia, you couldn't breathe. It wasn't practical to leave, but you would leave. Right? You would leave and figure it out because this isn't safe to stay. So a lot of times it's not practical to leave, but it's necessary. It's imperative. Um, and so I think you have to decide um, how, how sick you are. Um, how do we stay well in an environment that broke us? So I think, again, you have to ask yourself, what broke me? Was it him and what he did, like cheating and lying and hitting and sexually abusing me or the kids or those kind of things? Or was it that I wasn't capable of enduring or living with a person who didn't love me like I wanted him to, right? And how do I, like, I think of Leah and the sister, Rachel, you know, Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. And Leah never felt loved. She kept popping out these babies and she'd say, now he'll love me. Now my husband will love me. Now my husband will love me. And I think at the end, he kind of loved her. But at the first five boys, I mean, she had all these boys and Rachel didn't have any boys. And she kept thinking, okay, now he'll value me. Now he'll love me. Now he'll love me. And finally, she said, I think she gave it up. And she said, you know what? I know God loves me. I know God loves me. And I think for so many women, we have put our marriage and our man at the center of our heart. Like he has to love me or I will die. And so that breaks you. It will break you because it's idolatry. It's idolatry. Jonah tells us those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be ours. Your husband is not to be your God. He's not to be your everything. And when we put him in that place, it will break us because he's just a mere mortal. He's not God. He's, he's not perfect. When we put another human being in God's place, they can never fulfill us or fix us or heal us or give us everything we need. It's impossible. And so I don't know what broke you. Was it whether it was your own idealistic or unrealistic expectations of your husband in marriage or whether he did something specific that harmed you and broke you? And if that's true, you, it's, it may not be practical to leave, but it may be necessary to leave because you don't want to be broken again. And so I think that's where you have to discern and talk to the Lord about that. What if they are just criticizing others and you find it hard to listen? How do you say things to him? I think, I think in, a, in a moment you might say, would you be open to some feedback that I've been noticing? And he might say no, and then you don't say it. Or he might say, what, what? And just say, you know, I notice that you kind of get 
really unhappy when other people aren't the way you want them to be. You know, I notice that your boss and your mother and your brother and our neighbor and our son, and, you know, you're very critical of these people because they're not the way you want them to be. And I wonder what might be better for you if you could just let them be the way they're going to be and accept that instead of always being so critical. So I think you could practice what you want to say about that or how you want to say it. Um, and again, this is, I think this is being a helpmate. It's noticing something for him that he's not noticing. Right. So if if my husband notices that I've got broccoli in my teeth before I come onto a Facebook live, if I just had dinner or something, I'm happy he noticed because, you know, I'm not looking. I'm not looking at my picture. I'm looking in the camera. So even if I had broccoli, even if I had a big blotch on my face, I wouldn't see it because I'm not looking. I'm not I'm looking at myself now. But you can see if I'm not looking in the camera, I'm looking at myself. It's not the same experience with you. So I'm looking in a camera because I feel like I'm talking to you, but I'm not looking at me. So if he noticed that I had something wrong with my appearance or my character, and he, you know, he, we have said that to each other over the years of marriage, you know, you're getting a little full of yourself, <laughs> whatever it might be, um, because that's what partners do. They've got your back. They've got your back. And so if you aren't allowed to be his truth teller, if you're not allowed to, let me just turn this off. If you're not allowed to speak the truth and love to him, then you're not fulfilling God's role in your life. And if he won't allow you to, then of course you don't push it. Just like people put their hands on their ears and they said, stop confronting us with the holy ones of Israel. You know, they didn't want to hear about God. And when someone doesn't want to hear, you're not going to be listened to. But I would at least start by saying, would you be open to hearing some feedback that I'd like to give you about something that concerns me that I see it's making you miserable and see what happens. If he still has remorse after he's verbally abusive, does it mean there's still a chance he could care about our marriage? He says he doesn't care if I stay or go when he's angry. He says the things he says when he's angry. He doesn't mean. What he says and does at different times are so different. I feel it, it makes my mind so confused and sick, not knowing what is true and not true. Um, so... If he truly is remorseful over things he said, I, I, we've all said things in a, in a temper. We all have, including me. We've all said things in a temper that we deeply regret, right? But when that happens again and again, then that says something else. And I'm not saying they don't regret it, but what they're, they're doing is they're not taking responsibility for it. Right. So if every time I eat ice cream, I vomit and I vomit every time I eat ice cream and I vomit all over the carpet and all over your couch and all over that, I would think I better not eat ice cream or I better go to the doctor and figure out why am I vomiting every time I eat ice cream. So the fact that your husband shows remorse, like, oh, I regret that I said that, or I'm sorry I said that, it hurt your feelings, but he doesn't seem to have the connection of, Next time I'm angry, what am I going to do different? Next time I feel that feeling of rage or disappointment in you or you didn't do what I wanted you to do, how am I going to handle that feeling? Because that's my responsibility. People are going to disappoint me. People are going to frustrate me. That's just life. And this is the mindset. When we talked about mindset change, if your husband has a mindset that Nobody should ever frustrate me that life should always be the way I want it to be. And if it's not, then I'm just going to vomit all over it. Then he's pretty immature in his thinking. And so life, and I'm sure he doesn't do that at work or he'd get fired unless he's the boss and owns the company, right? So you just can't vomit over people when you're upset with them. And so obviously he exercises some self-control at work. And this is a really red flag, ladies. When they exercise, they're different at home than they are with other people. Don't tell yourself they don't have any control over that. They absolutely do because they know they can't do it because why? There are consequences. But with wife, oh, no, you can't leave. There are no consequences, right? And we've structured that in our teaching theologically. Oh, you have to stay no matter how he treats you because that's God's will. Is it? Is it? Does God care more about him than her? I don't think so. The prudent see danger and take refuge. 
God expects marriage and created marriage to be the safest relationship, not where you feel afraid of your partner, where you have to sleep with someone. You want to feel safe next to them. You don't want to feel like they're going to wake you up in the middle of the night inside of you because you weren't awake. And so understand that God desires you to experience a tender caring, safe relationship. It might not be fireworks and all kinds of love those days when marriages were arranged. You might have felt that love later or not at all, but you at least felt safe. You at least felt safe. You didn't feel anxious that someone was going to verbally vomit all over you or hit you or sexually assault you. And so I would just say to your husband, I want to believe that you are sorry but when you don't do anything to change this behavior and you keep doing it again and again, it's making it harder for me to believe that you're that sorry. I need you to work on your tongue and your heart so that I feel safe with you. And I would say that this is what I need. And if he chooses not to do it, that tells you a whole lot. Right? My needs are more important than you. My needs to verbally vomit is more important than your need for safety. And I'll just mop it up afterwards. And you need to be okay with that. Do you? And I think those are the things that we wrestle with in these kind of situations. What impact does that have on you? Leslie, is conquer good for someone who has recently been emotionally drained, uh, divorced, emotionally drained, and who's seeking to get healthy emotionally after divorce and learn more about oneself emotionally? Or is it for those who are currently in destructive relationships seeking a system and wisdom? Um, so my friend Georgia Schaefer has a post-divorce group called... Um, Oh, I just did a podcast with her. It'll be opening up in November. Um, I'm going blank on the name of it, but if you just go to Georgia Schaefer, you'll find it, S-H-A-F-F-E-R. Um, but it's really more for after a while. So so there's this in-between time when you're still unhealthy. You're not really, re oh, it's called rebuild your life. You're not really ready to rebuild your life yet because you don't have the internal scaffolding to know even what kind of life you want to rebuild. Um, and so we do have divorced women in Conquer. Um, and oftentimes they stay for a long time. They become mentors. They want to support the next generation. They're still getting healthy. So conquer is about doing your own work. It's not about fixing your marriage. But as women do their own work, sometimes their husbands look at them and say, wow, you've really changed. What's happening? I, I'd like to learn some of this too. And they begin to get healthier too. And some escalate their, their abusive behavior because they don't want you to change. They want you to stay a, a victim and helpless and powerless and, and not healthy because it exposes their deeds of darkness even more. And so we don't have any guarantees that it's going to fix your marriage, but it is going to help you. And our statement is your kids need one healthy parent, at least one healthy parent. And when he's bad and you're bad because of your brokenness and because of your reacting to his bad, then the kids see a horrible mess at home. And so your kids need at, one, at least one healthy parent. So if you're identifying as unhealthy and you see your unhealthiness, so you might have an unhealthy narcissist and you might have a very unhealthy codependent who allows the narcissist to totally control her and take over her it, it might work for a while and look like the biblical marriage she's submitting and he's the head but it really is very toxic and unhealthy for the children and so as you get healthier your kids can begin to see at least one parent who knows how to say no who knows how to set boundaries but do it with love and kindness not in reactive anger and resentment and retaliation right? That's still unhealthy. So that if that's what you're looking to do, then yeah, Conquer would be a good place for you to be for, for a while. Okay. Besides the obvious answer of price, why is it so hard for men to get help to want to be different? Sometimes they're motivated, but mostly after there are major consequences of their actions. Yep. Um, I don't know, but this would be my guess because I'm not a man, but I have worked with a number of men and talked to a number of men. And I'm just going to give most of them the benefit of the doubt. Men are wired differently than women. Um, you, I've, I have a child that's a boy and I have a child that's a girl. And I've, I've seen the difference from the beginning. Um, if you notice little boys, they're always wanting to be um, competent. So look at me, mom. Look at me. I can do this. Look at me, mom. Look at me. You know, it's like, you know, like admire me. Notice that I can do this. Notice that I can, you know, kick this ball really far. Notice that I can write my name now. Notice that I can, you know, spell and whatever. Notice that I'm competent. 
Notice that I'm competent. I'm good at this. Notice me, praise me, you know, affirm me. Little girls are more seemingly right at the beginning about connection and community. Like, you know, even look at girl athletes versus boy athletes. And over the years, it's changed a little bit. Boy, girl athletes have become a little bit more masculine and all that. But the chest bumps and all that, like, look at I, in the in the football, you know, dances that they do. And women athletes, when they when they they're usually hugging each other, they're patting each other on the back, they're congratulating their teammates. Um, and so there's there's just wiring that's different. So going back to your question. I think one of the most shameful things for a man, and not for a woman, but for a man is to feel incompetent. Um, and that's why it's so hard for them to ask for help because then they would have to admit that they're incompetent at something. I mean, even the simple joke, like now nah, they don't have to, but in, in my day with my husband, he wouldn't stop and ask for directions because that means what? He's incompetent. So not gonna happen. It's not going to happen. I'm like, why don't we just stop? We're really getting lost. Why don't we? I'm, I'm fine with admitting I'm incompetent about something. I don't know where I'm at. Don't you think I can figure it out? So, so there is this pride in their competency and deep shame at their incompetency. So one of the things women tend to be better at than men is verbal. You know, we tend to be able to quick, quickly speak our thoughts and our feelings. We're able to have those connections between right brain and left brain faster um, and talk through things. And for some men, it's harder. And for lots of families, both men and women, they never learned to do it because their families never talked. So if you grew up in a family that just basically barked orders to you, but they never talked about feelings, they never invited you to think, they never invited you to argue with them back and forth so you could learn to do that well, you never experienced that. Or what you experienced was just more patriarchy, domineering, do as I do, not as I say, children are seen, not heard, that kind of thing. You never learned some of these verbal skills. And so when you get married and you need to have some of these verbal skills to deal with conflict or to express your feelings, or it's like a deer in the headlights, like they freeze, they don't know what they don't know, but they know they don't know how to do that. And so it's easier to be belligerent, put you down. You're too, you're too much, you're asking for too much, make you the bad guy than for them to look at themselves. I would say that that's a immature man, an, un, an unhealthy, immature man. And this is the hope. If it's that kind of guy, if you can come at them with your learning and your growing and curious questions like, hey, you mentioned you weren't happy, but let's talk about that. Why? Or not even let's talk about that. Why? And give him a chance to express whatever level of feelings he can express without shaming him. Oh, that's ridiculous. You don't want to minimize or shame someone like you wouldn't want them to do it to you, right? Because that shuts you down. So I would say that for an immature, uh, unhealthy man, your growth can put the lights on for him in some ways. And we've seen that happen. For a narcissistic or extremely unhealthy controlling man, um, it's just going to make a matter right? So he doesn't want to get healthy because it works for him. He gets to get his way all the time. So there's a different dynamic there. But going back to your question, um, it's hard for them to get help because it's, they have to admit they don't know. They have to, and to go to another man and say, I don't know how to understand what my wife is saying. I don't know how to be a good husband. I don't know how to be a good father. That is very humbling for a grown up man to say, just like, even going to someone at church and saying, I don't know how to, I don't know how to paint. Can you show me how to paint a wall? Cause we can't afford a, a painter, right? Or I don't know how to fix my toilet. Can you show me how to do that? Because I, I can't afford a plumber. They'd sooner slip their wrist than ask another man for help. If they don't know how to do it, they might ask them for help. Like if they can't lift something all by themselves, but to ask for help on how to, I don't know if that's been your experience with men, but that's been as a, as a female counselor and as a woman and a mother of a son, um, that's been my experience that it's pride. It's pride and shame, which are two sides of the same coin. Um, it's really hard for them to humble themselves and say they need help and admit that. So that's what I'm going to leave with. Um, let me just see if you could put in your chat, what was your biggest takeaway from today? What was the thing that God said to you?
What was most helpful for you? There's lots of things. And this is how I always read my Bible. When I read my Bible, I always say, all right, Lord, what are you saying to me? I just read three chapters, but I'm not going to remember everything. But what is it that I need to know for today? Because I'm at a different level. Every time I read my Bible, I'm in a different place, right? I'm more mature. I'm less mature. I'm, I'm in a good space or I'm in a bad space. But there's something for me that the Holy Spirit wants me to get out of this, right? And so what do you feel like God has spoken to you today about? What's your, what's your takeaway? That's important because learning for learning's sake isn't, isn't important. Learning for wisdom's sake, learning for growth's sake, that's what you want to take away. And so what is your takeaway from today that the Lord might be saying to you? Right? What might the Lord be saying to you today? Hello from Belgium. I'm looking at the chat here. Yeah, Kelly, you did get... Yeah, the church does put an emphasis on staying. They valued, and this is the phrase that I've used often, the church, not only in marriage, the church has valued the sanctity of the institution, including the church. That's why they've covered up so many scandals. They valued the sanctity of the church or the marriage more than the people in it, more than the safety and the sanity of the people in it. And you, we've seen this with the whole scandal with Ravi Zacharias, with Bill Hybels, with Mark Driscoll, with other church leadership. They've been accused and are guilty of gross misconduct. And yet the victims were the ones who paid the price. They were the ones that were vilified and they were the ones that were rejected and they were the ones who were told they were crazy and they were the ones who weren't listened to. Um, and those were the, they were the ones who were told, you're ruining this man's ministry. No, they're just trying to tell the truth. And that happens in marriage too. That we, We've somehow put the sanctity of marriage and I believe in the sanctity of marriage. I don't advocate for divorce for trivial reasons. But I don't believe you can stay in a committed, loving, or committed, uh, let, let, I don't even think you have to be in a loving relationship. But I do believe the basics are safety and trust. And you can't even live with a college roommate that you don't feel safe with, right? You can't even live with a roommate you don't feel safe with. How can you possibly share your money and your bed and your children with someone you don't feel safe with? It's not possible without getting sick. All right. Enabling evil. Yeah. What are your other takeaways? The older women in the church were taught to suffer in silence, and that's what they teach the younger women. God doesn't want us to be oppressed. You're right. Yeah, only once I accept my marriage is destructive, only then can I do something about it. Right, and April, you're responsible for you. Submitting to tyrannical abuse grieves the Lord and does not bring glory to his name. Yeah, and, you know, even in the culture, so I don't have the time to unpack this in the workshop, so I'll just share it with you here a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to go because I've got to continue to work on the workshop. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I'm not done writing it. All right, so in, in the Bible, it has two kinds of suffering and sacrifice, okay? And... This is where, again, we've misused the scripture. There's willing sacrifice and willing suffering. I'm writing these down. All right. And this would be like uh, S-U-F-F-E-R. I, I can't talk and spell at the same time. So willing sacrifice and willing suffering, that's when you are, um, no greater love has this than he who gives up his life for a friend. That's a willing sacrifice. If you speak the gospel and you know that you're going to be persecuted, count it all joy because you're suffering for the Lord. That's willing sacrifice, willing suffering. There's a place for that. There's a place for that in the gospel. Here's where it gets twisted. Right? The twisting of the scriptures, misusing of the scriptures. Then the Bible also talks about unwilling. Okay. Unwilling suffering. Okay. So, this is if someone slaps you on the cheek, if someone forces you to walk a mile, you're not volunteering for that. They forced you to do it. It's unwilling sacrifice, unwilling suffering, right? What does Jesus say? Or to the slaves, they're not willing slaves. Some of them are, were bond slaves, but many of them were unwilling slaves. Slaves, even if your master treats you harshly, you're an unwilling participant in this. You have a choice. That's what Jesus is saying. You still have a choice. Even when you were unwillingly raped, 
you were unwillingly forced to go one mile. You're unwillingly forced to take, give up your tunic. Whatever you were forced to do, you have a choice. You can show up bitter or you can show up better. That's that nice thing that we were talking about. How do I want to be kind? How do I want to show up? And he's saying, hey, I don't, it's not my way to retaliate. Don't repay evil for evil. It'll only get the best of you. It'll deform you. Turn the other cheek. Walk the extra mile. He's not saying willingly do that to an oppressor. Hey, guys, I'm willing to get slapped. He's not saying that. He's saying, hey, if someone abuses you, don't abuse back. Turn the other cheek. If someone forces you to do something, don't retaliate. Actually, be the bigger person and go the extra mile. Right? He's telling you to don't lose your agency, don't, meaning don't lose your personhood. You have choices. That's how I made you. You have choices. Pick good ones. Don't pick the default angry, bitter choice. Right? That's what we just talked about in that kindness uh, question that I get. But here's the clincher. So if we have to unwillingly suffer, we're in charge of how we handle that in our character. We can choose to willingly sacrifice only when it's for someone's good. So if I'm going to willingly sacrifice to allow my husband to sexually abuse my children or me, is that a noble sacrifice or is that a foolish sacrifice? It's a foolish one. We're not called to do that. We're called to not do that. And so, yes, we're called to willingly sacrifice. So if you, if your husband is dying of cancer and you say, I was going to leave, but he's pretty harmless now. He can't hurt me anymore. And I choose to willingly sacrifice right now and stay and take care of him till he dies. I think that's a noble sacrifice. You're loving your enemy. You're doing him good. And you're sacrificing your time and energy for his good, for his care. I think that's a noble sacrifice as long as he can't harm you in that position. Probably he can't. I did that with my mom. We were estranged for 15 years. Didn't see or speak to her. She was physically and emotionally abusive to me. And <clears throat> when she got cancer, she was just too sick to fight back. So I was able to willingly sacrifice my time and energy and fin finances, as I did my brother sister did too, to care for her, right? And it was, a, it was a privilege to do that. And she came to the Lord at the end. So it was all good, good, good. We didn't know that would happen, but it did. So there's a place to willingly sacrifice. But I wouldn't have lived with her willingly sacrificing myself just to enable her to continue to harm me if I could help it. I couldn't help it as a kid, but I wasn't going to do it as I got older, right? And so that's where self-stewardship, the prudency, danger, and take refuge. When Joseph was woken up in a dream, Herod was coming to kill baby Jesus, he didn't tell Herod, uh, Joseph to just trust me and willingly sacrifice if it comes to that. He didn't say that. He said, flee, right? So there's this difference between willingly sacrificing yourself for someone's good and willingly sacrificing yourself to enable more sin to continue. And that's what Christian leaders have taught women to do as wives just to keep a marriage together by lying and pretending everything is fine when it's not. It's rotten. I don't believe that honors God. I don't believe it honors her husband or honors her or the kids. It's a lose, 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 lose. And I don't believe it's biblical. So I believe in willingly sacrificing for someone's good, but not for their sin. Jesus died for their sin. I don't have to. Okay? So I think... Let me just, I'd love to see some of the takeaways you got from this. And then um, I hope you come on Thursday. Yeah, I'm trying to leave and he knows this, forcing me to spend my disability. How might you protect that, Lori? And how might you get some help to, you know, figure that out? I think that's really important for you. You've been such a trooper in this. Um, I pray God will rescue me from anger and redirect my attention to what he would have me be. That's so important, April, to really think about this because Satan doesn't want to just get your husband. He wants to get you and your kids. And if he can deform you because of your legitimate anger and hurt, which is true, if you're a victim, you're legitimately angry and hurt. But being a victim of someone's treachery can deform us if we let it. And so we have to be very intentional 
Do not let evil overcome you, but overcome evil with good. You're not going to overcome their evil. You're going to overcome the evil that's in you, that they just put in you by what they did to you. And you've got to overcome that or you're going to be deformed by the evil. Sort of like the whole Jedi Knight and you know how Darth Vader became Darth Vader. He used to be a Jedi Knight. And he let the dark side win because he was so disappointed. So if you've read the origins of the Star Wars story, it's a pretty poignant example of how the dark side can win when we're hurt and angry. And then we become the dark side, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen to yourself. <clears throat> yeah. When you're in the midst of adversity, it exposes your heart. It does. And, and, and when it exposes your heart, don't be like, I remember being in the car once and God exposed my heart because I was calling the driver in front of me a jerk. Now the driver didn't hear me. I heard me and God heard me. And, but it exposed my heart because he took my parking pot. It's like, jerk, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm just sitting in the car. And the Holy Spirit said, so we're a little judgmental here, aren't we? I mean, I just as clear as day. It was just between me and the Holy Spirit. And I said, I guess so. I, I guess so. And we both laughed. I laughed and he laughed. And I said, you know, Lord, I don't know if I'll ever be free of this, you know, but I want to be. I don't want to call him a jerk. Maybe he was going into that spot because his wife was sick at home and needed her flu medicine and he wasn't even paying attention to me waiting for that spot. I don't know his motives, but I immediately judged him as a jerk. And so, yes, it exposes our heart, but make sure that when that when the Holy Spirit does that, you don't come in with the enemy's words of, see, you're a bad person. God is showing you your heart so that you can become more like him. Have a good chuckle over it and repent. <laughs> and do better, all right? That's what God's calling you to do. Um, so let me just see the takeaways. Let me just get to the bottom. I'm seeing so many other comments. What are your takeaways from today? Let's see. I'm still not at the bottom. Sorry, we're going to go here. Practice, practice radical acceptance. Silence is enabling. Um, it can be. I feel really screwed up my interactions and maturity. Okay, that may happen, SH, um, but here's where you have to be. So if you look in the mirror and you say, oh my gosh, I thought I looked fabulous. If I leave here and go in my mirror, I say, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I did this whole Facebook Live with a big old booger in my nose. I would feel totally mortified, right? So sometimes when we see ourselves truthfully, we think, oh my gosh, I saw me and other people saw me and I feel horrible. I feel embarrassed, whatever. We have to get over that and be able to say, wow, thank you, Lord, for showing me the, the mirror of who I am or what I'm like now. I might not be like this always, but I'm like this now. And thank you because I can only correct. I can only fix that if I see it, right? And so the Holy Spirit is showing us some stuff. But the enemy will come in and say, see, your husband's right. You're just a horrible person. There's nothing good in you. I mean, he will just come in with those accusing words. So if the words you're hearing in your head are convicting and loving, like, hey, you, you kind of got this judgment thing going, you know, that was the Holy Spirit. It wasn't condemning. It was sort of even kind of playful. And I heard it and I repented. Right. When the accusing and condemning voice comes in, understand that's not the Holy Spirit. It is the enemy's voice. And he also adds lies to it. See, you're bad. See, you'll never get it right. And all of that stuff, be careful. Because those voices are loud and they can really make us have a bad day, if not worse. Okay? So we got to listen to the right voice. All right. What else? What else has been your takeaways? Yeah, we can relate to, everyone can relate to seeing something in the mirror that you didn't know was there, right? <laughs> Resentment is a killer. Don't expect them to take responsibility to care for you. Yeah. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. If I find something disturbed within me and have to ask, what is it in me that causes this disturbance? I can only change me. Until I accept the truth, I can, until I accepted the truth, I could not get healthy. The acceptance of the truth freed me from the destructive thinking and relationships. April, you're spot on there. Acceptance is everything that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. But accepting that truth, even when someone dies, what is it? We don't accept. I can't believe this happened. I can't believe. And so we're so emotional because we're not accepting it. And that whole grieving process takes us to acceptance. Yeah, I don't like it, but it is true. 
And once we accept it, we can kind of move on, but it might take us a whole year to accept it sometimes. But that's the process because we're resisting truth. We're resisting reality. No, it shouldn't be this way. No, he shouldn't be this way. No, it shouldn't be happening to me. And it is happening to me. And then how do I accept it so I can take the next right step forward instead of getting stuck in my resistance to what is? Anyway, I've got to go. I will see you tomorrow. We're going to be on with Coach Diana. And we're going to be talking about, um, let's see. So today we talked about abuse. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about indifference. What is indifference? And is it abusive? And how do you live with a husband who's completely indifferent to you? Like, if you're there, you're there. If you're not there, I mean, it, he doesn't really show any interest in you. He's fine. Just leave him alone. How do you live with someone like that? And without wanting to wring their neck or yours. Uh, so we'll be talking about that tomorrow. And again, if you haven't signed up for the workshop yet, please do that today so we can get you the information, your handout uh, on Wednesday. All right. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.